this city that we love so much and this home that we had so much be turned on its head in an instant. Um, and I wrote the book because I felt that while obviously the facts of what happened will remain in history forever, the feeling of it and what it was like to be there, I knew would not. Um, I felt, whatever, however many years, eight years later, I felt myself forgetting. Um, I knew that my readers um, were getting younger and younger, or they were younger and younger at the time of 9-11. Many of them who, again, were in kindergarten were younger when <coughs> the attack happened. They don't have as much first-hand memory of it. It's all sort of an impressionistic day. And soon, there will be people who weren't born at all who will be teenagers. So I wanted to try to capture what it was like. And I basically took my own experience and divvied it up to three characters. Um, I admit that entirely. Um, and wrote the book. It is not a book that I wanted to write. It's not a book I ever thought I would write. But sometimes you're just compelled. Um, and I was. So that's what got me here. And so, so I would say I love um, one of my favorite concerts ever was a round robin that was Patty Griffin and Lou Harris. Um, Buddy Miller and Sean Colvin. And Sean Colvin, the first night I saw them play, like every song she played was sort of a down and low song. And so every time, like, it would Harris be rocking out and everything, it would be Sean Colvin. She'd be like, now I'm going to bring it down. So I feel like after that, like, now I'm going to bring it down. But hopefully I won't bring you too far down. Because again, this is about the coming together. I'm actually going to read sort of from the halfway point. Um, for those of you not familiar with the lights, you probably are. They are on the cover of the book, so it makes it helpful. Um, on the six-month anniversary of 9-11, um, they lit the lights for the first time. They decided to shoot these two towers of light up from downtown, not in the exact space where the World Trade Center was, but, but a few blocks over. Um, and it really, it's a remarkable, remarkable thing. Um, it is probably the best monument I can think of um, to express what happened that day. And when they were first lit, it was very jarring because it was Again, we were already grappling with the changing landscape, and suddenly there were these lights down there. <coughs> but a lot of us sort of made pilgrimages down there at some point or another just to, to see them and to be there. Um, so the piece I'm going to write is from the point of view of Claire, a um, girl of the three narrators, who lived downtown um, and is evacuated from her home. She can't go home for, for a few weeks after 9-11. By this time she has, this is now talking about as the fall progresses into the Christmas season, into the new year, <coughs> so she finally is back home and trying to get her life back in order um, and trying to get back into her team. So that's where we find her. So this is the chapter called The Lights. The swim of things, leaves falling on sidewalks like autumn garlands candy corns and the way the light turns crisp as winter approaches, playground voices, conversations about favorite movies, favorite books, friends, New Year's, the snowman on the sidewalk, reading a story to your little brother before he goes to sleep, holding deer, realizing the difference between things and possessions, <coughs> that possessions are things that are dear to you, realizing with this word dear, that things are dear to me, discovering how dear life is. Same word, slightly different meaning, that twist of fragility. The weight does not lift itself, although over time it lightens. Sometimes we need to push, and sometimes that is very hard. It is still strange to see the skyline. I have never seen an absence that's so physical. It's possible I will see the absence for the rest of my life, even when there is something else there, which is okay. The thing to remember when looking at an absence is that you are standing outside of it. We still feel some things in common, and we still feel some things that are entirely our own. I can only say what I'm feeling, and even that is only the fraction that I can articulate at any given moment. I still have those childish moments when I wish with all my heart that I could wake up and find it's all been a dream. I really have thought that. I have felt stronger than grief, stronger than anger, stronger than despair, the profound desire to return to the netherworld of the safer past. 
There are still the flashes of unexpected sadness, <coughs> the pauses that last longer than they used to, the desire for retribution, the fear of retribution. Like a death in the family, like a personal tragedy, an event like this lays bare the complexity of our worlds, internal and external. But you can't live life in the shadow of all that. I think about the posters, how they went in a matter of days from posters of the missing to posters of the missed. Eventually they were taken down. Gone is not forgotten, but our lives cannot be a memorial. This city cannot be a memorial. This city has to be a city. Our lives have to be our lives. The swim of things. I go on an airplane. I walk under the Empire State Building. I take the bus and the subway, and I'm surrounded by strangers the whole time. I certainly have room in my life for caution, but I have no room in my life for paralyzing fear. There's always a risk. There always has been. But I'd rather live my life than die of negations. There is not one moment when that feeling of inadequate sorrow goes away. It just lessens and lessens until it is mostly a memory of itself. We live in the same apartment. I go to the same school. I apply to college. I get into college. Somehow six months pass. I'm not at home when they light the lights. I'm at school finishing up our, envi our environmental club newsletter. I'm the last one there besides the genders, and it's dark out when I finally leave. It's March 11th, and I've been aware of the anniversary all day, but I still gasp when I look downtown and see the beam of blue light coming from where the towers used to be. I feel such a silence pass through me. Ghosts. I know what I have to do. And suddenly, it's the opposite of that day, because instead of walking away, I am walking toward. Instead of taking my brother's hand and heading north of 14th Street, I am alone and heading home. The towers have been resurrected as spirits, and I am going to visit them. In the chilly night darkness, they are their own beacon. All I have to do is go down the street and face the right way. There they are. Alighting over the tops of the Soho buildings, hiding behind the street lamp glare, arching over our heads. I keep walking. I keep following past Canal Street past rain. I still find it hard to see ground zero. I still find it hard to witness the nothingness. The lights are not a remedy for this. There will never be a remedy for this. But they are a strikingly apt presence. They are both something and nothing at once. They fill the space without claiming it as their own. They are translucent. translucent. They blur. I walk down the nearly empty Westside Highway. I walk past Stuyvesant toward the pedestrian bridge we all saw on TV that day. I think of turning back. I'm not sure I can do it. I've been so good about getting back to normal, about moving on, about forgetting enough so the pain doesn't keep me awake, but remembering enough so that I'm a different, better person. The lights keep drawing me on. Because I know that in a short time they will be gone and I know I have to experience them before they disappear. I reach the base. It's not at ground zero. It's a few blocks over, surrounded by offices that were untouched that day. <coughs> you can see the buildings right through the lights. Each beam is made of dozens of singular rays that seem at the bottom entirely like the latticework of the towers. There are not many people at the base, mostly families, the children running around as if they're at a playground, a light show. I don't mind their laughter or their chatter. It's a nice juxtaposition against the size of the moment, like having a baby make a noise at a funeral. I face skyward, tracing the intersection of seeming parallels, light like specters and souls and geometry, towers of lights of towers. I walk to the edge of the lights and see ground zero, see each century 21. I could just go home. I could call it a night. But something about the lights has emboldened me. I head west, frightened. This is something I haven't told anyone. Not Peter, not my mom, not Jasper. 
Even though I pass by Ground Zero almost every day, I've still been afraid to go to Rockefeller Park.